This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the next 60 minutes, we'll run through all the business news stories you need to know about from right across the continent. But first, around through the markets. We'll be talking about Jumia in detail in a moment, but if the price of its depository notes at the New York Stock Exchange are a reflection of its potential as the prime poster child for e-commerce in Africa, well, that potential is looking pretty slim. The fall in by over 70% since the listing in April. We'll explore where the market goes from here and if Jumia has a future worth talking about. At the close of the week, Nigeria is the worst performing market here so far in 2019, down by just over 14%. Ghana's main market, not far behind the composite index over there, is down 13% in the red. Here's what's coming up tonight. South Africa's blocked arms sales to several countries in the Middle East. We'll explore why. We'll also look at the effects of the ongoing US-China trade war on the United States shopping season. And Zimbabweans are embracing solar power as the country is struggling to deal with crippling power shortages. Well, that's a noise in the pipeline for you tonight. But let's start the hour in the business of weapon sales. South Africa has stopped arms sales to a few countries in the Middle East. The country has a domestic homegrown arms sector that exports a range of defense products to over 26 countries around the world and the United Nations is also quite the client. But it's concerned about where and how these weapons are being utilized. CGTN's Sumitra Naidu starts us off tonight. The temporary embargo stems from a clause in the National Conventional Arms Control Act. Arms sales should not be used for internal repression or violation of human rights. In order to ensure that weapons are not transferred to third parties, South African officials need to inspect these countries' facilities to verify compliance, but they're being blocked. It seems as if South African arms have been used in conflicts in Yemen, for example, especially personnel carriers and mortars, uh, you know, rockets, uh, and sometimes drones. Uh, and this is in uh, violation of third-party uh, distribution um, protocols, you know, in, in, in arms transfers. South Africa's arms industry is worth around $350 million. The largest exports are to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. The two things concern me about it, really. One is a lot of the industry is on the cusp. It's not going to survive much longer if we go on the way we're going on. And then we lose it. And to recover it is going to be almost impossible. And the other one is if we really offend Saudi and the UAE and they pull that $10 billion each investment in South Africa, what's that going to do to our economy? Then the whole plan of rejuvenating the economy and getting job creation going is out the window. But South Africa is now weighing up sales against human rights. It's normally an international law. If they enforce the laws, it's actually a good thing from South African foreign policy because it shows it's moving back towards the situation of uh, looking more at human rights concerns and also enforcing uh, international law on arms transfers. And there will be job losses if this continues to be enforced and especially if the contracts get cancelled. Uh, however, you know, in saying so, uh, there's currently a conflict happening in Yemen. Uh, you know, we've seen over 50,000 people die, hundreds of thousands injured. And so from a, you know, inter a strict international law, human rights perspective, uh, it's good. The enforcement is very progressive. The real problem in this case, though, is the countries that are being blocked are the main customers for Danel, existing and with future orders. And without them, the bottom line is Danel is going to crash and burn. South Africa now has to decide on whether to save its arms industry or uphold human rights. It recently signed a $4.5 million arms deal with Saudi Arabia. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, barely 24 hours ago, the e-commerce platform Jumia seized operations in Tanzania, just 10 days after doing the exact same thing in Cameroon. Now, the company says that the move is part of a group-wide effort to refocus operations and resources in other African markets. Jumia, as we speak, is only operational now in 12 African countries, down from 14. The retailer will still run its classified services in Tanzania through Jumia Deals. Did the exact same thing, of course, in Cameroon barely a week ago. 
So then, where exactly does this company go from here? Ali Kansaju, the CEO of Rich Management, is live with me in studio tonight. Welcome back. Rama, thank you. So Good to see you. Th the, last, the last time we had this conversation, you mentioned that you wished you'd put <laughs> cash to work in Jumia. Look, before when yesterday. we spoke about it, we were talking about a different era, a different world, pre-WeWork. The market was booming for this kind of thing. Uh, you know, so from a market point of view, we've gone from a, 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 a time when every boat that was put in the sea was being floated mm -hmm. to a completely new era. Is so, it, is it, is it, so do, we, do we make this a macro argument? I, mean, so let's, I, I, I think part of it is a macro argument, right? This is the, that whole unicorn business, the boom, boom days, uh, you know, Massasan pumping everything up with steroids, a, a very different era. This sort of caught on to that Amazon of Africa. They were smart enough to list themselves, and the initial investors were probably smart enough to take some money off the table. So on a macro point of view, I think you, you know, you've gone from a boom to a bust in these types of stocks. But having said that, of course, we then had the Citroen research report that yep. came up after you and I spoke together. And now it looks um, a very sorry story. And but it's it, told to you in the share price, right? Indeed. A collapse of what? This is 75%. I think we got close prices. to $50, and we're now something like 6 Yeah, $6.20 so, at this point yeah. in time. But Jumia's management, when, when they comment about this, because they've, they've, they've kept the communication on this very tight. They're only it's interesting, isn't it? The study in communications, precisely actually. Precisely, because is a, is during the listing, it was let's get out there, let's do interviews, mm. let's talk about the market. They engage in this debate about whether or not they're actually an African company. Now it's a very different story. It's the occasional two-paragraph statement coming out, and they're saying that this essentially is portfolio optimization. In our world, that basically is code for we're cleaning house. So where's yes. the next domino going to fall? Well, uh, you know, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. So I think, you know, decisions like Cameroon and Tanzania are probably sensible ones. They probably just are not scaling up at the speed they, they were hoping they would scale up at. They seem to be concentrating on Egypt and Nigeria, big markets, big opportunities. But, you know, they're talking about spinning out Jumia pay. I think it's going to take more money. I don't think they're going to get to that break-even point quickly. They don't have the firepower to make it, in my view, now. I mean, given the way the market is. I think in the go-go period, they would have raised more capital. They would have done the secondary issue. People have been, would have been still excited about it. But now, I just don't, I don't see how those numbers are going to make up. I was looking at the sort of total sales volume. Mm. Um, the margins are just not there, I don't think. I think you've got to have deeper pockets. They'll be taken over by but somebody. But at a fundamental basis, we're going to come back to the yeah. question of, of, of the defensive play later, but even just at a fundamental basis, before they put up their notes, they'd already burned through $900 million. That's right. By the end of September, they're talking of losses of about $150 million yes. on top of that. So, is, And a is market it, capitalization now of, what, $400 yeah, million? Yeah, which has basically collapsed. It's, yes. it's, worth, it's not even worth talking so, about so inflation numbers, but the execution just wasn't there. Well, that's what I think, you know, the likes of Rebecca and Echong have been criticizing them for and saying, actually, there were lots of, uh, uh, there was a lot of spin on the execution. It just, the, the execution was, wasn't what was being, what was written on the label. And it's difficult to execute in our markets, Ramo. You know, we're not consolidated European, Chinese or, or U.S. markets. Mm -hmm. We're very fragmented. Just getting the delivery right is so complicated. But there's, there's a counter argument to that, though, and I saw this um, coming up in, in trading circles locally. The argument being that if you're looking at Kenya, for yes. example, or, well, let's leave Nigeria to the equation, but a market like Kenya, yep. you've got a reasonably functional postal system. It's been running for the better part of six decades. Yes. But isn't the problem here that a lot of these tech firms show up and they say, well, I'd, I don't want to work with that. Let me set up something entirely different on mm. my own. And we ignore something that's not as sexy, Yes. but it works. It does it? It does. Oh, yes. Okay. I just haven't had a post office box for years. <laughs> but you can still send a letter. Yes. You know, it'll still true, get from point enough. A to point B. So that's an interesting point, whether they thought they could just reinvent the whole logistics thing. I think reinventing logistics and delivery is a highly complex task. And I think that people who specialize in that, someone like Jumi, I don't think had the skill set to do that in multiple jurisdictions. But having said all of that, if you look at the take up of the smartphone, 
you look at how people are living today, you would have thought there was an opportunity here. But I think it's a long tail. And I think you've got to have deeper pockets. And I think you've got to be able to stay in there for much longer. And I think their fundamental problem is negative equity, lack of cash. And post Citroen and, and in this new environment where people really don't have as much faith in that sort of profit type uh, CEO. With a blitz scaling model. Going, blitz scaling going model. Yeah. You know, pe people don't have the patience. I mean, you've seen that in much bigger companies mm -hmm. which have blitz scaled. I mean, take Uber, for example huge number of uh, daily trips being made, but people have become much more skeptical. Right, and of course, Daria is facing problems with the, the loss of business in London. Yes. Um, in April, we, you mentioned one of the, the, the areas we explored is that this might be a defensive play yes. for Rocket Internet. List the company and hope that someone snaps it up. But yes. in this environment, right, where people like Masayoshi Son, uh, Masayoshi Son have been humbled, does that argument still have any merit to it? I, is there I, anything I, worth buying here? I, I think that's a really interesting question. I'm sure a lot of people are running a slide rule over it. I think the interesting point is that they are still in a number of African countries. And if you were a big player, you know, like the like of Jeff Bezos, because they kept calling themselves the Amazon of Africa, mm. you know, it might be an interesting play and a very cheap asset to pick up, but basically a free option, I, I would think, for those big boys. It looks to me like a, even an Alibaba, for example, I would have thought would look at it and say, look, half a billion dollars to get into multiple countries with some infrastructure and we can then beef it up. I think that's, I think that's the way out for shareholders right now. Whether they're going to pay any kind of premium on the current price is a different matter. Well, we'll but really, that. it's like a salutary lesson, isn't it? All in the space of less than 12 months. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, I'm struggling to find a faster crash in, in, in share prices. No, and I must say, you did call it. Uh, I was more optimistic. I was seeing a more bullish market at that time, but obviously those days have gone. Well, cash is king. Um, one last question for yes. you. So one of the things that we, we spoke about again in April mm. was, okay, now we're seeing um, African businesses or other businesses being built in Africa. Let's not call it an African business. That's a separate debate. Yeah. A business being built in Africa, tapping into capital markets, in the West. But given what we've seen with Jumia, does this ruin the prospects of any other African unicorn, for lack of a better word, to raise capital in the West? I, I think it improves the opportunity for indigenous African unicorns to raise capital because people will see that this was truly not an African managed company. It was African in name, it was operating in Africa, but it was it, it was run by folks out of Germany and all kinds of places. With offices in Dubai. Offices in Dubai. And I think what people are going to say to themselves is we're better off having our management on the ground, embedded in the ground, understanding what's going on. And that's why I think this is actually an optimistic moment for African entrepreneurs. Ali Sachu, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me. All right, then a quick run through some company headlines for you. Let's start with the utility in Kenya, Kenya Power. It says there will be a further delay in its full year results coming out. That's due to the absence of a new government auditor general. The state-owned company had been granted an extension uh, to the time it could release the results to the 30th of November. Elsewhere, the international travel agency, the Flight Centre Travel Group, says it will stop selling tickets for South African Airways. That's the first time that the group has had to issue a stop sell order on the national carrier. The latest decision comes as SAA recovers from a week-long strike, which costs the airline over $3 million every single day. Still in South Africa, the country's third largest mobile operator, Cell C, has rejected a takeover offer from Telcom. This is not the first time that the 40% government-owned Telcom has made a bid to buy Cell C initially attempted to take over the firm in 2017, only to be rejected in favour of a recapitalisation plan led by Blue Label. And finally, shares of the British online grocery pioneer Okado were up by as much as 15% after striking a deal with the Japanese retailer Aeon. Now, that deal is particularly uh, interesting. It will see Aeon establish a national fulfilment network that will serve the whole of the Japanese market. That's a wrap through your head. We're 15 minutes into the hour. You're watching Global Business. Here's what's coming up next. Kenya Airways CEO calls on the government to nationalize the carrier as soon as possible. And we'll go into the Karoo. This beautiful landscape has suffered from the worst drought in 
more than a century. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business, only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible and why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg, we'll see you tonight. Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just a table mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Welcome back to the program. The government is being urged to move quickly to nationalize Kenya Airways. That is according to the carrier's current CEO. Sebastian Mikosh says that if Kenya Airways wants to be competitive, it has to retain its commercial flexibility and avoid some of the government limitations imposed on other state-owned enterprises. Right now, Kenya is looking to emulate countries like Ethiopia, which runs all its air transport assets, and that's everything from airports to fueling operations to ground operations, and it carry itself under one company. As a result, in July, the East African economy voted to renationalize the loss making carrier. Kenya Airways was privatized more than 20 years ago, but it sank into debt and losses in 2014 after a failed and highly divisive expansion drive. As an airline, we, we, have, a, we have a need of, uh, of, of course, equity injection, we have a need of uh, cash flow improvement, and we have. Um, Mm, yeah, we have a need of, of, of growing our market share. So, so yeah, if we had 450, but uh, 350 would do too. It's not. It's not a. It's not a. It's. It's more of a, Again, it's not a. <laughs> it's not a precise accounting figure. KQ can be profitable, but I don't believe it can be profitable without investments, because you know in this industry, if you want to have a, if you want to have a dollarless costs, you need to invest two dollars. And I'm not talking about bringing billions of dollars for the fleet. No, 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 no. I'm talking really about the things on the ground. 
Egypt's president has launched a new health insurance program in the North African economy. Citizens will contribute 35% of the costs to the health insurance pool. The fees collected will account for another 30% and the treasury will cover anywhere between 30 to 40% of the remaining costs. PSGTN's Yasser Kim explaining how this is going to work. Patients in the city of Port Said have been enjoying the benefits of the new comprehensive health insurance scheme. It's the first city in Egypt where the project has been implemented. My daughter did an open heart surgery here. The quality here is the best I've ever seen. All the procedures were done quickly. The donor found and the operation was successful. The service was excellent and everything for free. I didn't pay a penny. In the old insurance program, I would have paid half the expenses and I couldn't afford it. Now the Egyptian president has called for it to be applied nationwide. The new health insurance program is a major upgrade on the current one. The insurance program gives free health services to all members without discrimination. Any Egyptian family can apply. Registering costs are minimal and it covers all health issues unlike the previous one, which was limited to certain ailments and covers only a fraction of the costs. The average contribution of treatment per person has increased from $11 to $120. It's a costly project for a country recovering from years of economic volatility. There are challenges in implementing the program. Notably, you need an overhaul of the run-down state-owned hospitals to be able to provide the required high-quality services. Another challenge is to encourage doctors to work in the program. You must raise their salaries to make it attractive and provide them with courses and scholarships abroad to get the proper training and experience. For the first time, health insurance will cover all Egyptians, regardless of financial or employment status, as the government will pay the registration fees for those who cannot afford to. Initially, the new health insurance program was supposed to be gradually applied over the 100 million Egyptians in the next 15 years. However, the Egyptian president has now ordered for it to be implemented in half that period. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Now, the Southern African region is currently facing a severe drought that has deeply affected the way of life, particularly in the Karoo. The region's temperatures are rising at twice the global average, and there's no alternative source of water there. CGTN's Ucho Koronko takes up the story. Karoo in the Hoysan language means land of thirst. The region has always been parched, but the residents of its oldest colonial town, Grafrené, were not prepared for the worst drought in more than a century. As the dry spell continues into its fourth year, tap water has now turned into the color of silt and bears a horrid smell of rotting fish. So these are very, very hardy fish, and it just shows us the immensity of this specific drought. This is a true disaster. In the Karoo of South Africa, and I suppose in all the semi-desert areas of the world, God provides drinking water and keeps it in two ways. One is in the clouds and one is underground. If we cannot locate these crack zones on earth, we will never know where to dig for water. Residents here have now been forced to form queues at overused municipal boreholes. Farmers' animals are also dying in their hundreds after the 46 million cubic meter in Kebadam receded. In 18 months we had uh, 25 mills and, um, and we had it in one month and with no follow-up rain. So uh, it, it's, it's had a hell of an impact on us. And uh, as you can see, the, the sheep and, and, and gorra goats is dying. His, his mother dried up and didn't have any more milk. And uh, they can't just, they, they can't make it in, uh, in, in, in this drought uh, period. According to data, the abnormal temperatures have been caused by rainfall that is 75% below average. The United Nations has now confirmed that 45 million people in Southern Africa are now facing hunger and drought. Notably, Karoo is long past water rationing that could
could be a preventative measure to curbing this drought. Proper sanitation is almost impossible to attain, let alone clean drinking water. We are even struggling. Look, look at me. My stomach is running. I couldn't even wash myself. I just dry clean myself. Look at me. And look at the house. It's dirty. There is children. What about gastro? The challenges many face in Karu are dire. And humanitarian assistance may not be enough to turn things around. Ucheo Koronkwa, CGTN. Now, the Sahel is reported to be one of the most vulnerable regions of the world to climate change. According to the UN Special Advisor to the Sahel, the region has become the most likely area to host the largest population disproportionately affected by global warming. Now, one of the sectors experiencing severe change is fisheries. Take a look. Lake Wenya in Mali's Sahel region, 120 kilometers north of the capital, Bamako, has served generations. Modest Traore has seen three generations before him provided for by the lake. But the lake is now evaporating. The fish are fewer, and Traore's future and that of his family of 14 children and a wife is uncertain. The problem is that the lake is shrinking, and the water doesn't stay long enough like it used to. It becomes completely dry at one point in the year. The lake is a source of food, water and income for around 12,000 people, including fishermen, farmers and herders. In the last 20 years, the lake has gone down by more than 80% during the dry season. All around this lake, people build up fields for cultivation very quickly, especially around the time when the water recedes. Communities could come down to the lake, define a perimeter around the lake for cultivation, and when the water levels rose, they would go and leave behind debris. Lake Wenya is a designated Ramza site, a wetland of international importance and rich biodiversity. We fight against erosion by filling up bags with sand, which we put in some areas, but that is not an immediate solution. With 80% of Mali's population living in rural communities, global warming is causing multiple natural disasters and degradation of natural resources. If things go on like this, I don't think our children can become fishermen like us. Personally, I don't believe in it anymore. But we're working on ways and means of making sure that the water from the lake doesn't completely disappear. The United Nations describes the Sahel region as one of the most environmentally degraded regions in the world and has projected temperatures to increase 1.5 times higher than the global average. If you add climate change and insufficient rainfall to the behavior of the communities, well, if they don't change, in the next five years, the lake could disappear in five years. But there's hope. Villagers in the area have planted 56,000 trees in two years and are better managing the water resources. I do see a better future for this community because they have started to apply all the techniques this project has brought to them and they have started changing their ways. And maybe in the next five years, the efforts will push back against the claw of climate change on a lake that is a lifeline to a threatened community. Beryl Oro, CGTN. We're fast approaching 18.30 GMT. Time for break. Here's what's coming up next. We'll explore how the trade war between China and the United States is affecting the United States shopping season. We'll also take you aboard a, a, a boat in London that can only be sailed with green power.
worried about your life at that particular time? Not at all. What is your assessment of the state of the continent today? Africa has the potential to power itself. Excuse me. <laughs> Business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. With a dedicated and diverse team of anchors, CGTN now brings Africa to the palm of your hand. I'm Penina Karibe in the heart of Nairobi, which is bustling. From everyday heroes to the continent's most powerful figures, we bring their voices to you. We haven't changed. And this is something most of us are very excited about. We bring you news that's changing perspectives. News that brings Africa to the world. CGTN. See the difference. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move, and it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchiyo Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. Welcome back. Let's recap the stories making you headlines at this hour. Zimbabwe's government is providing aid to more than a million households in an attempt to avert what essentially is being described as a threat to national security. The country ranks among the topmost food insecure nations outside a conflict zone. Elsewhere, the Sudan transitional government has, applied, has approved rather, a new law that seeks to abolish the party of the former president, Omar Hassan al-Bashir. It will also do away with the public order law, which was used for decades to regulate how women could dress. Dismantling of al-Bashir's party was one of the demands by the protest movement. So the law also allows the assets held by the former ruling party to be seized. And finally, a number of people have been stabbed and a man has been shot dead by police officers in an attack at the London Bridge. The Metropolitan Police have declared this stabbing attack to be a terrorist incident. The suspect who died at the scene was believed to have been wearing a false explosive device. That's a run through your headlines.
Right, and on to other matters now. The United States holiday shopping season has kicked off, marking effectively the start of Christmas shopping. But a recent survey on Amazon shows that rising costs from tariffs on products made in China are now forcing sellers to push even harder just to make similar margins. A report by the consulting firm Jungle Scout shows that 42% of sellers on Amazon say they will have to charge more for goods imported from China because of tariff hikes imposed by both parties. 38% of sellers are also cutting their typical holiday discounts. But 61% of sellers say their sales are higher than usual. And analysts, of course, are attributing that to Black Friday and the upcoming Cyber Monday boost. In addition, the survey also shows that more than half of Amazon sellers have offered deals and discounts as part of wider efforts to boost sales. Still in the United States, the country's National Retail Federation expects that the country's retail sales will top $730 billion this holiday season. And travelers are going to be a major contributor to that spending number. The United States usually sees the heaviest traffic during the year-end holidays. Data from the American Automobile Association showed that 55 million people will be on the road to travel or to visit their families on Thanksgiving Day alone. That's nearly a 3% jump compared with last year, marking the busiest Thanksgiving in 14 years. Analysts say the roads traveled and routes flown stimulates consumer spending through the holiday season. You know, it's been estimated that 7 out of 10 jobs in the United States have some sort of direct or indirect connection to travel. All those roadside attractions and restaurants and what have you, their numbers go up when more people travel. Some traditional holiday events are attracting tourists with more creative ideas. The Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York presented its partnership with Japanese artist Yayo Kosama and Netflix cartoon series Green Eggs and Ham. I love them because they're so huge and they look so cool. And do you have a favorite one yet? Snoopy. Uh, we're in New York and we're going to go to the Thanksgiving, uh, the Macy's Day Parade. Other than New York City, Las Vegas and U.S. state of Hawaii and Orlando are expected to be the most crowded with tourists during the holiday season. That's according to online travel platform Trivago. Uh, we're trying to go to Honolulu and um, enjoy the Thanksgiving holidays with our family. Traffic data company Inrix estimated that over 4 million Americans will fly somewhere for Thanksgiving, a 4.6 percent increase from last year. Meanwhile, American Automobile Association data showed that road travel could increase 2.8 percent on year. Michelle Vandenberg, CGTN. Now, there's a different kind of vessel that's been built in London. It's a boat that can only be sailed with energy from solar, wind, hydrogen or battery power. Your captain on this voyage, Mr. GTN's Emma Keeling. The shipping industry is one of the most polluting. 90% of trade is seaborne, creating 2 to 3% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions. But this boat is on a six year mission around the world using solar, wind, hydrogen, and battery power in an effort to prove that there is a greener way. I'm Emma Keeling here on the River Thames in London to see if the Energy Observer will be able to convince the maritime industry that what they're doing can be cleaned up. Can you hear something? Can you hear something? Very quiet. <laughs> Very quiet. Very quiet. I can't hear anything because it's running on renewable energy. Louis Noel Viviers is the development manager. This one of the uh, prototypes that we have been designed with the um, National uh, Solar Energy Institute. Mm -hmm. so they are double faced. They, they take up to 30% of the power from behind. From what, the so that you can get a reflection off the water and absolutely, get power from there? Absolutely. They get the reflection from the water and from the paint because the paint is slightly metallized. On board, there are four tanks of hydrogen on either side and a set of 112 kilowatt lithium ion batteries that feed the electric motors. Another set of 18 kilowatt batteries power the facilities. So with this energy, we can sail with no wind, with no sun, for about three days and three nights. The hydrogen is made on board by electrolysis, where an electric current has passed through water, producing hydrogen and oxygen. So it was quite uh, tricky because we don't have a lot of space here. 
and we had to be able to build up this uh, factory able to uh, produce uh, five kilos of pure hydrogen every day. Five kilos of pure hydrogen, it's roughly, it is the same as, let's say, uh, 20 liters of pure gasoline every day. Captain Edersard sees the Energy Observer as part of a greater revolution. I simply wanted to show that it is uh, possible to navigate otherwise. And it is a much more effective way to educate politicians, citizens and indu industrialists uh, with a real ship that can be tested and touch rather than uh, a few promising slides of a keynote presentation showing uh, a time in the future. The future must be now. Now, for the first time ever, revenues from esports are expected to surpass a billion dollars this year. Professional esports airs on major sports networks and college teams have seasons filled with competition. Arguably, esports has come of age. As CGTN's Mark New reports, it's increasingly becoming part of an even younger academic crowd high schools. At Miramonte High School in Orinda, California, the eSports club needs to practice their skills. It's basically just to be ready for anything. Team members also study gameplay recordings of their upcoming opponents from Las Vegas. So we're going to make a hole in this wall right here so we have a better angle on this door. So that way when they come from this side of the map, we can, we can see them all the way from this side of the map, shoot them right there. With 45 members, Miramonte's eSports club is thriving despite originally being rejected by school administrators until Steichen changed their minds. I told them that a lot of colleges are actually like giving scholarships for esports now and it's actually pretty incredible what we have in terms of esports nowadays instead of what they think of it is just oh people playing video games in their basement. No. Miramonte's club is one of more than 2,000 esports clubs across North America that competes against other teams online in the High School Esports League or HSEL. I caught up with HSEL co-founder Mason Molino via Skype. If you win a competition with us, you'll be awarded scholarship. We've helped facilitate last year about $16 million in scholarships. Now, outside of that, we have a recruiting base of over 100 recruiters from across country that pull from our league. With competitions live streamed and recorded, university recruiters watch the action online, looking for esports players fit for their teams they're going and scouting like they would go to a, a high school football game. And if you display, you know, team building, anything outside of just actually playing, your ability to be coached, your ability to learn, um, your flexibility, are, are you toxic? Do you get angry? Do you tilt? Uh, those are all big deciding factors. High School Esports League has even partnered with a principal and a teacher to come up with an accredited curriculum called Gaming Concepts. It teaches students team building concepts as well as how to deal with online toxic behavior. It's already in a handful of schools and HSEL says hundreds more are considering it. Like they're not, there's going to be a lot more jobs related to video games in the future because that's what millennials uh, do. Uh, they, they want more video games. and. Uh, and so, uh, in some ways, this is a career preparation for, for the high schools. HSEL isn't the only league in town. Play Versus has raised more than $96 million in venture capital funding and also has thousands of schools competing in its league. All-Star Esports League, started by a 17-year-old gamer, just received a seven-figure investment. And if you look over at something like you know, the NBA or the NFL, they have all this infrastructure that they've built up over decades. Esports doesn't have that. And if you create these structures uh, underneath it, you can surface a lot more of the talent. They're there, they're there. They For Miramonte, studying and planning paid off as their team handily blew away the team from Las Vegas. Still, none of the team members I spoke to envisioned becoming professional esports players, saying reaching that level was just too difficult. Oh, so close. You oh. missed it. Club President Steichen says what's more important is that players like himself who have never been athletic enough to play traditional sports have finally found an activity where they can utilize their talents and win or lose as a team. Mark New, CGTN, Orinda, California. Now, it's not new that marijuana is getting legalized in an increasing part of the world. For instance, in Colombia, medical-grade weed is a growing business. But there's a lack of funding to actually build out the efficient value chain that this sort of business requires. As our correspondent, Michelle Begay, now explains. Javier Roberto Hidalgo was once literally a student of marijuana, taking courses on the cannabis plant and later giving seminars on the topic. 
So when Colombia passed legislation in 2016 to legalize medical marijuana use, Hidalgo didn't hesitate to enter the new industry. Not only can we take away that negative image, it might be possible to create a productive company with good salaries and good working conditions, then create a range of products that take away people's pain. In 2017, La Santa Botanicals was created with a mission to grow high-quality cannabis for medicinal purposes. With permits in hand, its founders began with a cannabis plantation and slowly ventured into building a pharmaceutical laboratory. The plant's components are used in a variety of products, from pain relievers for cancer patients to oils to curb seizures in epileptic patients. As global investment in the cannabis industry hits record highs, Colombia is getting a large slice of it. That's because Colombia enjoys a prime geographic position to produce quality plants and has a farming workforce already skilled in producing coffee and flowers. De los costos, la luz. On top of the low costs, the numerous hours of sunlight, the different altitudes and the climate, we have a qualified labor force. It is estimated that we are going to have a higher percentage of cannabis plantations than we do flowers. With many countries now allowing medical marijuana and countries like Canada and Uruguay leading the way on recreational use, the industry is growing fast. A new report by the market research firm Prohibition Partners suggests global legal marijuana revenues could top $100 billion by 2024. International interest in the industry says La Santa Botanicals was critical to get the company started. But while it has outside investment from Canada, it proudly touts it's a majority-owned Colombian company. And among its 60 employees, 85 percent are local farmers. But starting a company in an industry that was once illegal has its challenges. Los bancos. The banks are reluctant, like, wait, what do you mean marijuana? And I have also heard this from investors who are afraid of investing their money in this industry. Attorney Andres José Pajón, who specializes in the cannabis industry, says lawmakers did a good job back in 2016 covering all regulatory aspects of this emerging market. Everything is regulated. How to get permits to cultivate, how to get permits to make derivatives, how to get permits to commercialize and export, even to import seeds. I think it is one of the most complete legislations in the world, without loopholes. I think this gives investors peace of mind. And for companies like La Santa Botanicals, the direct foreign investment is needed for things like machinery to help extract the oils used in medicinal products. No, no, no nos we want to create products that will get to the drug stores to help solve real problems. La Santa says it's well on its way to getting there, especially with a new collaborative agreement at Colombia's National Cancer Institute. Michelle Begues, CGTN, Bogota, Colombia. All right, then, I'll talk about you of rather different kind. Ahead of the next meeting of OPEC Plus, this time next week, Reuters is reporting that OPEC's oil output has fallen this month, down by about 110,000 barrels a day compared to October. Part of that is because Angola's output declined. Also worth keeping in mind for next week, the final offer price for the Saudi Aramco IPO. We're going to find that out on the 5th of December. It should make for some very interesting conversations around the valuation numbers for that company. Cocoa prices up about 4% or so, so far this year. The International Cocoa Organization is forecasting a supply deficit this season of over 20,000 tonnes. Time for a short break. We're back in 60 seconds. Images may appear to be identical. But looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. The greatest journeys the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival, and hope. Ugh. So let's explore.
CGTN. See the difference. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. And no one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to the program. With dwindling power supplies and crippling power shortages, Zimbabwean enterprises have very strong incentives to adopt solar as an alternative source of power. That ideally should also help the Southern African nation adhere to environmentally friendly clean energy targets. Here's CGTN's Farai Mokutuya with the details on Grassroots tonight. Intermittent power supplies and weekly increases in the price of diesel for generators have seen solar and battery storage systems change from alternative to main sources of energy for many businesses. Zimbabwe is endowed with abundant solar resources. The, the potential for solar voltaic alone is estimated to be 100 gigawatts. Our solar radiation resources are greater than 20 megajoules per square meter a day. In simple terms, this is 100. 100,000 megawatts of potential power that is in existence. Zimbabwe's current peak electricity demand is about 1,800 megawatts per day, a mere 1.8% of what's potentially available from the sun's rays. Government measures to ease duties and potential cost savings over time justify the investment. Bottling company Schweppes Zimbabwe recently commissioned a rooftop solar installation which will meet up to 70% of its power demands. The energy I was sold is 25% of Schweppes overhead cost. At some stage it moved to 40% when they started having to run the generator. So obviously by innovating and putting solar which can last for 25 years, your guess is as good as mine. They're probably going to be around for a very long time as a business. The landmark project is the largest rooftop solution in sub-Saharan Africa outside South Africa. The 1,560 megawatts of power it will generate will lower the national carbon footprint. This is equivalent to 1,216,800 tons of carbon emissions per year. This is roughly 56,334 trees being saved in one year. Beyond solar, Zimbabwe has potential to generate hydro, wind and biomass to power industries and homes and leave some excess for export. The government is coming up with policy to harness clean energy sources in a bid to turn the tables on its current status and become an energy exporter. Farai Mokutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. Right, then we start with the bulletin in e-commerce and talking about Black Friday as well. So it's only fitting that we wrap up with the same thing. It's that time of the year again when shoppers are looking out for the best deals available online and offline. Here's CGTN's Kalechi Mekalam now taking you to Nigeria, where some of the country's largest malls and e-commerce platforms are busy trying to woo customers with the most competitive discounts they can. Call it a shopping fever. Nigerians are catching up on U.S. famous holiday sales Black Friday. Bakangizo is a major one-stop shop in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. Items from cosmetics to clothing, groceries, pharmaceuticals and several others all under one roof. The catch here is a massive price slash on items, slashes that go as much as half the price. For um, purchases 39k and below, we have a discount of 5%. From 40 to 99,000, we have 7% discounts. 
then from 100,000 and above, we have 10% discount on all products you could lay your hands on in the supermarket. And then for selected items, we have up to 50% discount. Such items will be handbags, ladies' shoes, um, a whole lot of items. Large, medium and small-scale businesses have adopted the Black Friday culture. Efforts to get shoppers to save towards the massive sales begin as early as September. Shoppers like Ifeinwa are now taking advantage of this opportunity. So far in my shopping alone today, I think I've been able to save like 30% of what I would have spent ordinarily on a good day without the Black Friday sales. So I think it's a good one. I'm glad. But beyond the sales, businesses here see Black Friday as an opportunity to reward loyal customers. Although it has its roots in the United States, this tradition has gained a lot of popularity here in Nigeria. Introduced in 2013 by Nigeria's foremost online store, Jumia, Black Friday has now got at least one out of every four Nigerians living in urban cities planning to cash in on the opportunity. Kilechia Mekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. And we wrap up the bulletin with a run through some currencies for you. So Ghana is steady, weakening yet again against the American dollar today. Down about eight tenths of a percent, 5.68 was a number on the board. That essentially brings year-to-date losses on that cross to over 12 percent so far this year. We've also seen a rather curious trend of very little demand coming through for Kenya government debt over the last few weeks, even for short-term debt. And that happened in the, in the auction this week as well. The government came to market looking to raise about $230 million. Total bids, barely over $81 million. Make of that what you will. That's it for tonight's edition of Global Business Africa. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content you've seen here in the last hour. There are many ways to get your thoughts back to us. All of them are on your screens right now. I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last hour. The World Today is up next from Washington, D.C.